Realtors, Good Deal Insurance Company, and Dean and Hamilton Realtors, and Craig just came to the door. <laughs> Thank you, because they make this possible. challenged daughter, Rosemary. The story of Rosemary's life gives testimony to the destructive power of stigma and its power to isolate and diminish persons with intellectual differences. This author talk has special meaning for us at this library because we're in the second year of a grant initiative for serving people uh, with intellectual and physical differences. So we think the timing of this is great. And um, we're really happy about the work we're doing in this library to provide equal access for all. Rosemary, the Hidden Kennedy daughter, has gotten so many great reviews. But I particularly liked the description in the National Review written by Florence King, who says, here is a writer who rejects today's penny-ante responses of empathy and compassion and compels us instead to receive humanity's sacrament of pity. Rosemary the Hidden Kennedy Daughter was on the New York Times bestseller list for 10 weeks and the winner of the 2016 Massachusetts Book Award. In addition to the Kennedy biography, Dr. Larson has written Bound for the Promised Land Harriet Tubman, Portrait of an American Hero, and The Assassin's Accomplice, Mary Stewart and the Plot to Kill, Ma Mary Surratt and the Plot to Kill Abraham Lincoln. Please join me in welcoming Kate Clifford Larson. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, it's great to be here, and I'm so happy to be here also to talk about uh, Rosemary who I hope, if you haven't read the book and you haven't heard me talk before, you will leave this room with a greater appreciation of Rosemary's legacy and what she has done for us as a people and as a nation. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself, how I came to write about Rosemary, and then I'll, I'll give you some highlights or, and lowlights of her life. Um, and then we'll have questions afterwards if we have a few minutes. So, um, I have my MBA, I worked for an investment bank back in the 1980s, and um, by the early 90s I was kind of tired of, I, I mean I had a great job, don't get me wrong, but I was sort of tired of being the only woman in the room and always asked to take the notes. And I had a great boss, he would always take the notes, but it was like, oh, when I'm like 60, which I now. I thought, uh, you know, do I still want to be taking the notes? And I'd always had a passion for, for history and women's history. So I decided to go back to school to Simmons and get my degree in women's history in the early 90s. And um, I started researching Harriet Tubman's life, uh, that an infamous and famous Underground Railroad agent, former slave, who now is going to be on our $20 bill, yay. Um, and she now has two national parks in her honor. I finished my master's, I went on to get my PhD at the University of New Hampshire, and I wrote my dissertation on Harriet Tubman because no one had written about her um, since the 1940s. And the research just changed everything that we had come to know about her. And after that was done, I did my book on Mary Surratt. Um, and when I started that book, I thought, when I started the research, poor Mary Surratt. I'm going to research this, 
and I'm going to prove to everybody she was innocent, and I'm going to save her. <laughs> and I was so wrong. Yeah. She was so guilty and so awful, so terrible. <laughs> so it was hard to go from unbelievably fabulous Harriet Tubman to Mary Surratt, a wicked woman. Um, but when I was working on the Mary Surratt book, um, in 2005, January of 2005, Rosemary died. Um, and there was like a three paragraph obituary in the Boston Globe. And I read it, and like, you know, every New Englander, I know about the Kennedys, I had read several of those Kennedy biographies, and I knew a little bit about Rosemary, mm -hmm. but there was something about those three paragraphs. And as a woman's historian, it just hit me, and I thought, this is so tragic. We really don't know what happened to her. It's not fair. So I had in the back of my mind that when I was done with Mary Surratt, I would go to the Kennedy Library and see if I could do any research, maybe write an article about her or something. 2008, I'm done with Mary Surratt, and I go to the Kennedy Library, and I happened to go at just the moment when they started opening Rose Kennedy's papers and uh, her journals and diaries were available for the public to see. Now the Kennedy family has gifted many family papers to the Presidential Library through the Family Foundation. And when they gifted the, li the papers to the library, they gave them on condition that the, the collections would be open at staggered dates over like a 25 year period. And so at that moment, I walked in, they were opening that portion of the collection, Rose's diaries and journals, and some of the family letters that went, the kids wrote to their parents. So I started going through the collection, and what do I see but letters that Rosemary had written to her parents and to her siblings. And as soon as I read those letters, I knew that I could do more than an article, that I had a bit of her voice and I could write a biography of her. So that started my journey. It took me six years of research and writing, and, um, and finally the book came out in 2015. So I fell in love with her along the way. It's hard not to. Um, an incredibly wonderful sibling to those Kennedy children, and I hope that you fall in love with her too. So this is what I learned about Rosemary. She was born in September of 1918, and it was uh, to Rose and Joe Kennedy, which hopefully most of you know, this famous New England family. They already had two little boys, Joe Jr. and Jack, who would go on to become our president. And so Rose, was they were living in Brookline. They had hired an obstetrical nurse to be with Rose to help uh, get her prepared and wait for the doctor to come to deliver the baby. Rose goes into labor, the obstetrical nurse makes her comfortable, calls for the doctor to come, but he's delayed because the Spanish influenza has hit Boston for the second time. Mm -hmm. It had already gone around the globe once, killed mm -hmm. millions of people, it was doing it again, and thousands of people in Boston were sick and dying. And he couldn't get to Brookline to deliver the baby fast enough. Rose is deep into labor, the baby's coming quickly, she's already had two before. The obstetrical nurse who had been trained how to deliver a baby had also been trained to delay the birth as long as possible because the doctor should be the one to deliver the baby. So she tells Rose, don't push. Well, that's kind of hard not to do. Then she said, well cross your legs. You know, that doesn't work. Then she held Rose's legs crossed to stop the baby from coming. When that didn't work, she held baby Rosemary back in the birth canal for two hours until the doctor could come and deliver the baby. The doctor arrives, delivers the baby. Phew, everyone's happy. Rose has a little girl. She seems perfect. Rose and Joe are thrilled. They feel like they've been blessed in the city where so many people are sick and dying and they have this lovely, beautiful little family. And Rose is thrilled because she grew up with sisters and she, you know, now she has a baby girl. And she wrote in her memoir how Rosemary was a wonderful baby. She didn't cry much, she didn't fuss, she was just so easy. 
But then they began to notice that she was slower to sit up, uh, to crawl, to walk, to talk, to feed herself, to do all the things that infants and toddlers do. You know, basically you all get the idea of the months that those are going to happen. At first they tried to convince themselves that, well, Rosemary was a little girl, and little girls are probably slower than boys. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> and they had these two rambunctious little boys bouncing around the house, so they, they felt comfortable with that assessment. But as you know, the Kennedys had many children. Eighteen months later, uh, Kathleen, who they called Kick, came along. Eighteen months after that, Eunice is born. And those two girls developed along a normal or a standard kind of development, uh, developmental stages and over a few months. Eunice in particular, she was like right out of the starting block. She's starting to walk at 10 months and talk and tell everybody what to do and you know, she's really an exceptional child. And they're noticing that Rosemary is having difficulties. Um, but they just kind of ignore it. Their family is growing and, you know, everyone's just happy. Um, these pictures are of uh, Rosemary, Kick, and Eunice. The, the Kennedy Library is filled with fabulous photographs of the family. And here's Rosemary with Eunice. They would become the closest sisters. And Eunice, of course, would grow up and take care of Rosemary as a teenager, become a very close companion. And then as adults, uh, Eunice would end up taking care of all the arrangements for Rosemary's care. But they were very, very close. Um, these are in Cohasset. These pictures are from Cohasset when they vacationed there. But they began to notice that Rosemary couldn't figure out how to ride a tricycle. Um, she didn't know how to steer a sled on a snowy hill. Um, she couldn't steer, you know, she didn't know how to sail. She could never figure out how to work the, the sails and she just couldn't. And swimming was difficult. Everything was difficult for Rosemary, whereas the other kids would pick things up very, very quickly. This photograph of Rosemary on a tricycle, I know she couldn't ride it, but she was a very determined, stubborn little girl. And I can just hear her demanding they put her on that tricycle and take her picture, which they did do. Um, over here, she's on a sled with Eddie Moore. Now, Eddie Moore was Honey Fitzgerald's right-hand man when he was mayor of Boston. He was just like his great secretary administrator. But when Joe Kennedy started becoming more and more successful in business, Eddie Moore was employed by Joe and became his right-hand man. Eddie and his wife Mary did not have any children, but they were incredibly close to the Kennedys, and they were like an aunt and uncle to all the Kennedy children. And Eddie Moore was Rosemary's godfather, and he took that role very, very seriously. He really was like a, a second father to Rosemary. And Eddie Moore actually is the man that um, our Senator Ted Kennedy was named after, Eddie Moore, Edward Moore Kennedy. So Rosemary, you know, they, they accommodated her, they adjusted things, but they could see as she aged, she was having more and more difficulty doing things that other children her age and even her younger siblings were doing. But Rosemary's happiest times were with, when she was with all of her siblings. And the Kennedys had this philosophy about their children and raising their children that their children would be each other's best friends and they would watch out for each other and the older ones would teach the younger ones. So they were always, they were like just a neighborhood in, in itself. Um, so they were always together. And this picture over here is Joe. Um, he has, I think, Eunice on his shoulders. Um, I put this he picture here to show that Joe was really a very present father when he was home. He loved his children deeply, and he was very affectionate with them, um, and he was very demonstrative with them, and they were like that with him too. So while he wasn't around all that much, they were deeply, deeply attached to their father.
As a matter of fact, if you go to the library and you read their letters, there's this stark contrast between the letters they wrote to their father, the Kennedy children, versus what they wrote to their mother. They would write to Joe and say, Dear Daddy, I love you so much, Daddy. You know, Daddy, 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 we love, da 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 When they wrote Rose, it would be Dear Mother. The letter would be more formal, and at the end it would be Sincerely, Your Son, Bobby. Um, now, that's not to say that Rose didn't love her children. She, re she loved her children just like mothers do. But she was the disciplinarian. She was the control in the family to organize all those children. So she was very stiff with them, not like Joe, who would swoop in and pick them up and do all sorts of fun things for them. So they had very different parenting styles. So Rosemary go, you know, just gets carried along with all the siblings. Um, they, the siblings learn to accommodate her disabilities and her, the challenges that she faced. They accommodated them. They included her in everything. When they went sailing, she couldn't sail by herself, but she would be crew. Even though she couldn't really help, they, they congratulated her and made her feel successful in anything that the family did. Of course, there were certain things, no matter how hard they tried, she couldn't do. Rose and Joe had this habit of, at the dinner table, they would have questions for the children that they would have to answer. And it would be questions about history, or politics, or literature, or um, current events. And Rosemary often could not keep up with the questioning and answering. So as she aged, she would become more and more frustrated because she couldn't keep up with her siblings. They enrolled her in school, in kindergarten, at the Edward Devotion School in Brookline when she was five years old. The teachers immediately knew that Rosemary was intellectually delayed. They, they just knew it right away. Rose and Joe brought in tutors. Rose worked extra with Rosemary, trying to help her, they thought, catch up with her peers. It didn't happen. She was kept back at least once in kindergarten, possibly twice. But the Kennedys ended up moving to New York in the mid-1920s. Joe wanted more opportunities for himself. Uh, the sort of Brahmin, Yankee elite in the Boston area were not as open as he felt they should be. They, he wasn't welcome in their clubs. So he wanted to branch out into New York. So they moved to Riverdale in New York. And Rose and Joe enrolled the kids in public schools there, and uh, the older boys went to private school. But there, Rosemary continued to slip behind. Kick and Eunice just went on to grades beyond her, and it became more and more frustrating for Rosemary because she knew that she was the older sister, so how come her younger sisters were doing better than she was? So when she was um, 11 years old, Joe and Rose made a decision to send her away to a special school in Pennsylvania called the Devereux School that was established by Helen Devereux, who was a pioneer in creating educational and curriculum materials for children with intellectual disabilities. And she had created this program in the Philadelphia school system, which was very successful. But she decided to own, open her own private school, and it was a boarding school. So Rosemary was sent to the school, and it was very traumatic for her at 11 years old. Now, oftentimes, children who have intellectual and physical challenges, but particularly intellectual challenges, often are immature as well. And this was Rosemary. Rosemary was more immature than her peer group as well. So she sent to the school away from this cocoon of a family that accommodated her, included her, helped her, um, accepted her, and then she goes to the school and she thinks she's done something wrong to be cast out from the family. Now, the school had two rules. The students had to do well in their classes, and they had to behave. And if they didn't do either, they couldn't go home for Thanksgiving. And Rosemary knew this, 11 years old. 
so as Joe wrote to Rose that fall of 1929, she went off to, Rose went off to Europe. She had a habit of taking like two month vacations periodically. She went off to Europe and he sent Rose a telegram and said, well, Rosemary raised Cain, but she seems to be calming down. In the meantime, Rosemary starts writing to her father and saying, Dear Daddy, you know, I love you so much, Daddy. You'll be so proud of me. I'm getting A's in English and A's in math and A's in history. But the teachers are sending letters to Joe saying, Rosemary isn't doing well at all. This poor child is so frantic that she's not going to be able to come home for Thanksgiving. It really was very hard on her. So for two years, she was at the, sent to the Devereux School. And Joe and Rose became very frustrated because Rosemary didn't seem to be progressing very much. She did learn to read at about a third to fourth grade level and write at about that level as well. Probably third grade, maybe fourth. These pictures, uh, she's probably 13 in the picture on your, the left. The one on the right, uh, she's probably 11 or 12 or so, and she's reading a Hollywood variety kind of reporter magazine where all the movie stars are in it and fashions. She loved the movies. She loved movie stars. Of course, Joe, by this time, has invested heavily in a studio in Hollywood. Movie stars are coming in and out of their house. They go to premieres in New York City. So she's very much into fashion and movie stars. In some ways, she was very much like her mother. She loved fine clothes, and she was very much a girl, very, very much a girl. She would write letters about having her hair done and her nails done and her eyebrows plucked. So she, the Kennedys gave her a really great life, except this frustrating thing about school and education. So Joe and Rose began to believe that it was her stubbornness that was preventing her from learning, that it wasn't an intellectual issue. So they decided to take her out of the Devereux School and start sending her to Sacred Heart Academy schools, which are very difficult schools. She could not cope at all with that high caliber sort of education. The Kennedys, from between um, the time she was 11 and 18, she went to five different schools. And each time, the transition was more difficult than the last. She just you know, transitions were difficult for her, and the Kennedys seemed to ignore that that was an issue. Um, but over time, you know, she would, would, she would adjust, and then her happiest times were with her family, being together with, they, with them. Um, this is a very famous picture of the family. Uh, Teddy is not in this photograph. I think Rose is pregnant with him. This is probably the summer of 1931. Um, but they're all just, you know, happy together. This is Rosemary right here. But those were fleeting moments for her. Now, while she was so happy to be with her siblings, it also was very frustrating, especially in the summertime where they're running off to go sailing and swimming and playing football on the lawn and uh, hand sport and doing all sorts of active things. So uh, she started as a young teenager acting out at home and having incredible tantrums and she would start hitting people and hurting them. So the, the Kennedys started to become very concerned. Um, this is a sample of one of her letters at the Kennedy Library. I know that she had to rewrite this letter several times. She had a tutor or an aide helping her. Uh, most likely they had lined paper they put underneath the note paper so that she would be, you know, write straight on paper. She had a tendency to write up the page or down the page. Um, her spelling was, a, you know, very, very <coughs> difficult for her. Sentence structure was generally poor. This is a very good letter. Generally, she would capitalize randomly. Periods would go anywhere in a sentence, and often uh, most of the words would be misspelled. And her thoughts weren't very clear either. But this one was very well done. As you can see, you know, she says, "Well, dear Daddy, you know, I had a great time with you." I would do anything to make you so happy. Um, I hate to disappoint you in any way. Practically all of her letters to him start off or end that way. Um, it's really, she felt the pressure of doing well in school. So as they sent her to other 
Sacred Heart Academy schools, other boarding schools for young women that were very, very, you know, high caliber schools, they stopped telling the school administrators and the teachers that she had intellectual challenges and would leave it up to the school to figure that out. And also her emotional ups and downs. And she, as she was going into her teen years, she really had some very dramatic swings in her moods. The Kennedys began to believe that um, there was a cure for her. Joe brought in every expert that there had to be a cure. They met a doctor in Boston who was a famous endocrinologist, and he had discovered that hormones affect growth. And he erroneously believed that hormones also affected brain development. And so he convinced the Kennedys to let him give Rosemary, as a, like a 15-year-old, hormone injections once a week for a year. And he said to them, I promise she will be 100% at the end of the year. So here's this you know, teenage girl going through hormones that naturally happen, and then who knows what those hormones were in 1935, you know? Ugh. And he's giving them to her every week, and she's just struggling and struggling and struggling. But eventually, you know, she becomes, um, she grows up, and Joe, in 1938, he's been climbing the political ladder, so to speak, in the Roosevelt administration. And he's immensely wealthy. He's incredibly successful. He's a, he has a brilliant business mind. He's made tons of money in the movies. Some say bootlegging, you know, whatever. Um, but he is very smart businessman. He's made great investments. So, uh, but he also wants a political career. Um, President Roosevelt appoints him ambassador to Great Britain. And for Rose and Joe, this is just fantastic. It is a great stepping stone, and Rose is thrilled because she's a political being, too. She was raised as the daughter of Honey Fitzgerald. She loved politics. She knew how to be a political wife. And she also saw this as an opportunity for all those children to be on a world stage. They would be in London. They would meet, meet world leaders and ambassadors and great literary figures and just famous people, and they would have opportunities that they would not have had just staying in the United States. They would travel. So they were very excited to go there. So in the spring of 1938, they start bringing the family over to London. Rosemary is the last one to be brought over because they did figure out eventually that transitions were really difficult for her. So Rose wanted to have the ambassador's residence, everything all set, all the children all set before Rosemary arrives so that they could pay a lot of attention to her. She set sail with Eunice, Eddie and Mary Moore, and um, Kick, this is a picture of Kick, who is now 20 years old, I mean, uh, uh, 19 years old. She's graduated high school. She's thrilled to be going over because her social life is going to blossom in London. So these beautiful young girls, you know, head over, and um, it's, it's going to be a, a promising, wonderful experience. This is also a famous photograph of the whole family at the ambassador's residence in <coughs> London. And I love this photograph because it captures the family at that one moment where the world just holds so much incredible promise for them. The boys are, have grown up. Joe's thinking about their political careers. They're in Europe. It's just amazing for all of them. It's very exciting. There's Teddy, who's now six years old, right there in the middle between Joe and Rose. Um, he turns out to be quite the little politician, even at six years old. But the, I mean, it's such a beautiful photograph of the family. It really is. And it just captured that moment of happiness, sheer happiness and hope and, and promise. So when they arrived in the spring, uh, the spring is when uh, London has its social season, and that's when the debutantes have their parties, and they come out, they have their debutante parties and coming out. And the height of that season is the presentation at the court of St. James of the debutantes to the king and queen. So Rose and Joe decide that Kick and <coughs> Rosemary are going to have their debut, and they are going to be presented to the king and queen. 
And this is a huge deal. So there are all these protocols that you have to uh, adhere to to meet the king and queen and during this big event. So you have to curtsy a certain way, you have to shake hands a certain way, you have to say certain things, you have to carry your posies a certain way, your dresses have to be a certain style. So Rose picks out magnificent designer gowns for the girls. It takes them two weeks to train Rosemary on how to do the proper curtsy. It takes kick about two hours, but Rosemary, they had to keep drilling her over and over again. Now, as she became an adult, the Kennedys rarely brought her out in public, but when they did, they had trained her to not really say much, because if she was allowed to talk at any length, people would figure out there were some intellectual issues there. So they tried to keep her secret from everybody. Um, so she was used to not saying anything. Well, when they were in London, the photographers followed them everywhere because it was this big Irish Catholic family with you know nine kids, and they were just in the tabloids or in the newspapers all the time. <coughs> but Rosemary didn't talk, but she was beautiful. And the reporters just were fascinated by her. They just love taking pictures of her and seeing her. So I put this photograph here because it just captured for me that little bit of spunk that she had and that look that even though she didn't talk to the reporters, that's what they wanted. They wanted to know who this girl was. Um, and that's a picture of all of the, there's uh, Rosemary, Rose, and Kick, and there's a maid on the other side. And there's a bank of photographers. Well, actually, the photographers go like two and three deep. There were so many photographers taking pictures of them. So they go to the event. Rosemary is called up to be presented to the king and queen. She does her curtsy. She starts to tumble a little bit, but she catches herself. It's a complete success. Everyone is thrilled. So I look in Rose's diaries, and she writes how she's upset because the day after the presentation at court, the papers raved about how beautiful Rosemary was and how beautiful her dress was. And then there was like a sentence about Kit in her dress. And then the press slammed Rose for her dress because she wore a white dress with silver flowers and matrons, married women, were not allowed to wear white in front of the king and queen. So Rose, in her first big event as the ambassador's <laughs> wife, blew it. And she was so angry, not at herself, but at the press. And she wanted Kick to get more attention, not Rosemary. But I was so happy that Rosemary was the hit of the evening. So the Kennedys, um, they traveled all throughout Europe. Rosemary had several companions that went with her when, they, when they, she traveled with Eunice. They had a governess with her. Eddie and Mary Moore always accompanied Rosemary whenever they traveled. This picture is, uh, was taken, I think, the same day this picture on the front of my book was taken. It's in Ireland. And um, again, you know, she's just so beautiful. Photographers just love to follow her and take pictures of her. When my book came out, I got an email from a journalist in Ireland. He worked for the Irish Times or something. And he told me that his mother had been one of the governesses that accompanied Rosemary on her tour of Ireland. And he sent me copies of all the letters that Rosemary had sent to his mother while she was living in Europe. It was so nice of him. I wish I had had the letters before the book came out. <laughs> there was nothing earth shattering. Um, but anyway, so Rosemary had a full life. They traveled everywhere. Here they're on a street in Italy. As I said, she's always included in everything the family did. They went skiing in the Alps. They went and uh, Teddy had his first communion in front of the Pope. Um, they just, you know, they, the connections were incredible. But anyway, um, and this, here's Teddy waving. You see him waving to the politician. <laughs> So at the Kennedy Library, they actually have BBC news footage, because not only did photographers follow the Kennedys, but the news service did too. So it took pictures of them everywhere, and then it would be you know, used in movie theaters as news. The Kennedys are here, the Kennedys are there. So in this one, uh, there's Teddy, he's waving, he's going, hey everybody, you know, hey. <laughs> he's so cute. But there's Rosemary along with everybody else, you know, touring Europe and having a great time. So the Kennedys, 
enrolled um, the girls, the younger girls, in um, uh, convent academy schools, and uh, Joe and Kick and Jack, you know, were already too old to be in school. And Rosemary, uh, they enrolled in a finishing school for like daughters of ambassadors and you know dukes and duchesses and things like that. But she lasted about three weeks because it was a tough curriculum. It wasn't just really a finishing school. They did have tough things and she couldn't cope. So Teddy had been enrolled in this Assumption Academy School in London that was run by a nun. Um, well, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, let me just tell you about these pictures. Rosemary always had to be accompanied by her father or uh, Eddie Moore. They were always afraid that young men would come up and start talking to her. And they didn't want her to be exposed. So they would take her, and I don't know if you can see this, but Joe has this kind of grip on her arm. That was a lot of photographs of him doing that. And there's, you know, she, her dance card, her brothers would fill out her dance card for her. They would dance with her mostly, or they have one or two select friends that would dance with her. But she knew what they were doing, and she didn't like that. She liked the attention of young men, and she wanted to dance with other young men. So everyone was always scurrying around trying to protect her, protect her from young men, strange young men. Um, and while Joe and Jack and Kick were out having a ball. They were going to the races. They were going to every, you know, castle and this party and that party. And and Rosemary had to go to like a zoo opening with her father. <laughs> and there he is gripping her arm again. And she was very resentful about this. Very very resentful. But the school that Teddy was in was run by Mother Isabel Eugenie. And um, Mother Isabel said to Rose that she would take Rosemary in as a special student. Now, this was a school for like K through 12. But, so Rosemary is 20, 21 years old. But they, Mother Isabel said she would take Rosemary in as a special student. Mother Isabel had been trained personally by Maria Montessori. And she taught the Montessori method in this school in London. And she used the Montessori method with Rosemary, and Rosemary blossomed. She gave Rosemary goals that she could achieve and gave her tools to achieve those goals. And Rosemary really was the happiest she had been in years. Mother Isabel was a gifted, gifted woman, really a wonderful woman. Um, I got these photographs from um, the Assumption Sisters home in Worcester. It's a very small um, uh, um, order of sisters in the Catholic Church. There, I think there are about 1,800 of them around the world. But they do have a house in Worcester. And I went to meet them. And several of them knew Mother Isabel. And they told me about her and how magical she was as a person, as an educator. When my book came out, um, I got an email from this woman right here, this little girl who's praying. For those of you who are Catholic, you remember walking down the street like that. Um, <clears throat> she told me she was that little girl and she had dyslexia and had a very difficult time reading. And Mother Isabel helped her overcome her challenges and gave her confidence. And today she's a special ed teacher in the Los Angeles school system. So these stories are just miraculous how they carry forward for so many years. So Rosemary's blossoming, but the war is coming, and it's getting dangerous to stay in London. Mother Isabel moves the school out into the countryside just to be safe. And the Kennedys decide in the fall of 1939 that Rose and the children are going to go back to the United States. It's too dangerous. But because Rosemary is so happy, they decide to leave her with Mother Isabel out in the countryside. And so Rosemary is thrilled. She just is so happy. She's like, you know, bye siblings, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> so Eddie and Mary Moore stay behind. They check on her. Of course, uh, Joe had to stay because he was the ambassador. But he's still in London, and Rosemary's having a great time. But by the spring of 1940, the Nazis are starting to march across Europe. And they're heading towards France. And Joe and Rose realize, uh-oh, this is not going to be good. 
so they decide to bring Rosemary home. So on June 1st, Rosemary flies back. There's Eddie Moore with her. This is a picture taken at the Pan Am uh, building at the airport in New York. And this just shows you the press, they follow the Kennedys everywhere. They take a picture of her coming off the plane and it goes in the newspapers. But Rose was not prepared to take care of Rosemary. She hadn't really taken care of Rosemary for a very long time. So Rose went to these two young women, Grace and Carolyn Sullivan, who ran a summer camp in Western Massachusetts for Catholic girls. And they were the daughters of a judge who had been friends with Rose's father way back in the day. So she went to these two young women and said, I have this daughter who's been trained as a junior counselor. Would you please hire her for the summer to be a junior counselor at your camp? And Grace and Carolyn say, oh, of course, Mrs. Kennedy, no problem. <laughs> Just send her. Well, she'll be a great junior counselor, et cetera. Rosemary arrives at the camp, and very quickly, Grace and Carolyn realize Rosemary is not a junior counselor. She needs a junior counselor on her 24 hours a day. She's wandering off into the woods. She gets lost. She leaves in the middle of the night and goes out into the woods. They're frantic. They call Ro and they end up taking her into their cabin and using a dresser to block the door at night so she doesn't wander off. <clears throat> They're frantic. They call Rose, tell her, you have to come get your daughter. And Rose says no. And Rose goes off to uh, the Elizabeth Arden Spa in Long Lake, Maine, <laughs> and, and leaves these two young women with a camp full of girls. So they keep calling and calling. Eventually, Eddie Moore gets Rosemary and takes her to Philadelphia to the Raven Hill School, which is another Assumption Academy. But Raven Hill is the school that Grace, Princess Grace went to, and all these very daughters of wealthy people, ambassadors. She can't cope with that kind of curriculum. He erroneously assumed, oh, all Assumption sisters are the same. They're all trained the same way, but they weren't. Mother Isabel was special. She lasted about a month at that school. From that school, she sent many letters to the Sullivan sisters, crying, saying how sorry she is she had to leave, and how she d didn't want to disappoint her daddy, but she had to leave. She doesn't know why, but you know she cries every day. The Sullivan sisters, one of the daughters of the Sullivan, uh, Carolyn Sullivan, lives in my hometown. And when she found out I was doing this book, she gave me her file from her mother. And she told me stories about until the day her mother died, she was still resentful that Rose had done that to them and had done that to Rosemary by not being honest. Rose also didn't pay the bill for a year. Oh, I don't know what was wrong with Rose, but anyway. <laughs> so by the fall of 1941, uh, 1940, uh, Rosemary is there. They can't figure out what to do. but. Joe has been called back from London because he's doing a terrible job as an ambassador and Roosevelt is really ticked off at him and fires him. So Joe is in Washington, D.C. He brings Rosemary there and installs her in yet another convent. But at night, <clears throat> she is escaping and the nuns have to go out to find her and they discover her at 2 o'clock in the morning. She's been drinking. She's got leaves in her hair. Her dress is all crumpled. They're afraid of what's actually happening while she's out on the streets at night in Washington, D.C. So Joe clearly is very upset. Rose actually looks into having Rosemary committed to a psychiatric hospital in Philadelphia. Why they didn't, I'm not really sure. Joe decides that he is going to have Rosemary lobotomized. The spring of 1941, there was an article in the Saturday Evening Post about Walter Freeman, who was a psychologist, and James Watts, who was a neurosurgeon. And they were experimenting with a new technique called a prefrontal lobotomy. And this article, the, the two men were raving about the results, how it restored happiness and independence to all these people who were troubled in their minds and who just were struggling and had challenges. And, this was going to be the cure for everybody. So when I looked at their actual research, it was the exact opposite of what they were telling the public. Most of the people that had the surgery came out 
unable to live independently. Sure, they were not, maybe not as erratic as they had been before, but they could not live independently. Um, about 20% came out physically disabled when they hadn't been before. 16% died during the procedure. Mm. But they didn't tell anybody that. Now back in those days, there were no research protocols. There were no patient protections. They were allowed to do this. The summer of 1941, the American Medical Association came out and said, no one should be doing this surgery. It's too dangerous. These guys continued to do it at George Washington University Hospital. Joe went to Rose and talked to her about it. Rose went to their daughter, Kick, who was a newspaper journalist at the time in Washington, D.C., and asked her to investigate this. Kick went back to her mother and said, Mom, this isn't anything we want done to Rosemary. The results are just not good. But Joe went ahead and had Rosemary lobotomized just before Thanksgiving in 1941. The two men cut too deeply and Rosemary came out of the surgery completely and totally disabled. She could not walk or talk. She couldn't take care of herself. She was incontinent. It was horrible. That Thanksgiving, she wasn't there at the table. The first letter after Thanksgiving, Rose had a habit of sending letter, one letter to all the children. She put every name at the top of the letter and each there would be a paragraph dedicated to each child. That first letter after Thanksgiving, Rosemary's name is missing and there's no information about Rosemary. Eunice told her children it was 10 years before she found out where Rosemary was. Teddy wrote in his memoir that he was nine years old when the surgery happened. That all he knew was that Rosemary suddenly disappeared and that he knew that he'd better behave or he might disappear too. Joe, Kick, and Jack, Joe Jr., Kick, and Jack, I believe they knew, um, but I'm not really clear. Kick must have suspected what happened. Rose did not see her daughter for 20 years. I think Joe may have seen her once or twice. After the surgery, he transferred her to the Craig House in Beacon, New York, which was a psychiatric facility. It was not appropriate for her to be there. She needed physical therapy. But he left her there for seven years, eight years. In 1949, he transferred her to St. Coletta's School for the intellectually disabled, uh, children and adults in Jefferson, Wisconsin. They built a cottage on the property. They built an Olympic-sized swimming pool. A nuns lived with Rosemary in the cottage, and she spent the rest of her life there. She received incredibly good health care because the Kennedys could pay for it. And she had a really good life there. She learned to walk and talk again. Um, she had difficulty like dressing herself and things like that. She could talk, but uh, her sentences might be broken up. She could let you know what she needed, but she could not carry on a conversation. Um, her neck was permanently like hooked a little bit to the left, and one of her arms was hooked up like this for the rest of her life. She walked with a, a definite limp. But these nuns took amazing care of her. In 1958, Jack was on the campaign trail, and he took a side, secret side trip, and he saw his sister for the first time. And I have to believe that it shocked him. When he became president, he and Eunice set to work to start establishing um, uh, research centers. Uh, he s established a presidential commission to study maternal and child health and the resources available across the nation to help with further research on the causes of birth defects and how m women could be healthier when they're pregnant. How does that affect children? How does the birthing process affect children once they're born or during the birthing process? He signed into legislation several really important things. It established a new institute at the National Institute of Health dedicated to maternal and child health. And he, he got Congress to fund research into all of this. Um, Eunice 
is there accepting the pen from one of the pieces he legislation he signed like two weeks before he was assassinated. In 1962, the family came out in an article in the Saturday Evening Post that said that Rosemary had been born with, and they called the term mental retardation. They, we don't use that anymore. But they told the world this, and they said they hoped by telling the world they could get rid of the stigma, because there was clearly a lot of stigma. They did not tell the world that Rosemary had, had a lobotomy. That remained secret until the 1980s when Doris Kearns Goodwin found out and published it in her book, The Fitzgeralds and Kennedys. Um, but Rose got out in front of the story about Rosemary, and she, through the Kennedy Family Foundation, started funding, along with the encouragement from Eunice, research centers at hospitals and at universities to, to really investigate what happens, why do these things happen to children. So she became quite an advocate and helped change the stigma. Joe, Joe, Joe Sr. had a stroke in 1961. He couldn't walk or talk after that. He died in 1969. Rose finally went to see Rosemary in 1962, and the nuns reported that when Rosemary saw her, she screamed and hit her mother. Because, of course, even though Rosemary had difficulty communicating, she never forgot who she was. So after Joe died, Rose started bringing Rosemary home, one week to Hyannisport and one week to Palm Beach. And there, Rosemary got to meet and get to know all of her nieces and nephews. And that is a really important thing because they got to know her and they fell in love with her and were inspired by her. So the, here's a photograph from Palm Beach on the <coughs> left. This is at Hyannisport. Those are the nuns that would travel with her from Wisconsin. And here she's swimming with um, Caroline and uh, Maria Shriver. I think this is Eunice here, and there's Rosemary. Rosemary was a very strong swimmer. She was a very strong woman, always had been, and she maintained that good physical health because they put that pool with Jefferson, and they, she had amazing <coughs> physical therapy and health care. Um, I talked to the Shriver boys, uh, Anthony and Timothy Shriver. When I talked to them, their, their love for their aunt just was, um, it, it just came out of the phone on their voices, you could hear it. They were deeply, deeply influenced by her and what happened to her. To, uh, Anthony shared photographs with me of her, personal family photographs. This one on the left was his favorite. This is a picture of a birthday party um, that he was there, and she had this house, this little apartment, so they would buy her typical things like a toaster oven for her birthday. Um, and there's one of the nuns with her too. But of course, the important thing is, Rosemary changed her siblings' lives. They made sure that no one was going to suffer the way that Rosemary did, the way she was treated as a child and a young adult, what happened to her because of the surgery, and so on. So of course Eunice starts the Special Olympics, and you know the world is a different place because of that, clearly. Jean, who was the only surviving sibling, established very special arts for um, children and adults with um, special needs. Um, and of course, our Senator, Ted Kennedy, during his 40-year career, sponsored, signed, co-sponsored, pushed through hundreds of pieces of legislation uh, dealing with um, accommodation, inclusion, uh, mainstreaming and education, the Americans with Disabilities Act. He really was, uh, along with many other congressmen and senators, he really did a lot of work, and it's because of Rosemary. And of course, uh, Anthony Shriver and his best buddies. We have the Best Buddies Challenge every May here. Um, Brady is uh, their patron. And so this is pairing college-age students with um, young adults with uh, intellectual <coughs> challenges. So this is Rosemary's legacy. You know, her story is horrifying, it's tragic, but because of Rosemary, we as a nation are in a better place, particularly for people with disabilities and their families. Thank you very much. Yes.
did, um, did they ever figure out, uh, you know, Rose and Joe, what, you know, the birthing process had caused that? So they didn't know that. Um, for a long time, they felt that her disabilities came from when she got scarlet fever when she was five years old, but it, the, the disabilities were appearing when she was an infant, so. Um, I think, uh, so no one knew that kind of stuff. No. Could, yeah, and I've had people in audiences over the past two years come up to me and say, that happened to me giving birth to my daughter in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. So the research that started going in the 1950s, but particularly with the push because of the Kennedy administration and the Kennedy Foundation, <coughs> research into what happens during in utero and then during the birthing process. How does that affect intel the intellect, disabilities? So that's when they discovered it. And that's when Rose started telling her story about what happened during Rosemary's birth. She finally started to put two and two together. Yes? Many of the traits that you describe sound like autism. Is that ever, can I, that connection ever been? Yeah, no, I, you know, I never read about that, but it was on my mind. But I had no way of kind of, I don't know. She, there were, she had a lot of physical challenges, too. Um, so that's why I, I link it to that birth, that something happened during the birth because of her linked with those physical challenges as well. Yes? Did she have, did Rosemary know what had happened to her family along the way? She did not, uh, no one knows what she knew, except she did see Jack get shot uh, on television. She knew that that had happened. Um, you know, she had, th those nuns were amazing with her. They loved her and took care of her. So, you know, they helped her cope with the tragedy. I don't know if she understood what happened. Her brother Joe was killed. Uh, in World War II, and Kick was killed in a, a plane crash in 1948, um, and then of course Jack was uh, assassinated, and then Bobby too. She was aware of that. There was another hand up over here somewhere. Yeah. Any other questions? I think it was such a wonderful and thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.